Hello everyone. It's July in 2017 and I've just come back from the SMAC conference in Berlin. I had a wonderful time. For the pre-conference workshops one of the things we did was collect cases and I'm going to show you the abdominal aneurysm cases that I took along to the workshop. Now I've been scanning abdominal aneurysms for perhaps 10 years now and I hate to admit but I'm still learning how to do it. When we first teach you this we make out that it's very easy and on the young slim models we practice on it is easy. But now I want to make it a little bit more realistic and give you cases, real life cases and real life questions so that when it happens to you uh, you've had a little bit of warning and a little bit of preparation and a chance to think about what you're going to do. The sorts of questions I'm going to put to you are um, what else causes a big black hole in the tummy? How can we tell if an aneurysm is ruptured? What else can cause abdominal pain beside the AAA? Uh, what can mimic a AAA? Because remember, once you have a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And finally, you have to start thinking ethically, what is the best care for my patient? Now the first case is an elderly man with abdominal pain. It's the middle of the night, a small hospital, and there's no formal imaging on site. And this is the only view you get. This patient's very distressed, not holding still, curls up on the right side, and all we have is this one view from the left. The question is, can you make a call on this? Is this a triple A? Well, goodness me, is it a triple A? Uh, is there anything else that can cause this sort of black hole in the abdomen? Uh, afraid there is. What could it be? Well, renal cysts are quite common. Very large distended gallbladders may look like this. What else can you do? Well, don't forget you don't have to scan from the front or even from the side. You can actually scan through the back, through the kidney, particularly if the patient's laying on the side. Now, a lot of the time we talk about putting on the the colour Doppler to show that there's flow, but it can be quite hard when the patient's very mobile. Do we call in imaging from off-site? Well, I think you should, if you have the option, because when you're first starting point of care ultrasound, it's more important to protect the patient from your own uh, lack of skill doesn't matter if your ego takes a dive, providing that the patient is safe. And if you don't have that luxury, what else can you do? Perhaps increase the analgesia and try again. Now if we do look at that picture again, one thing I'd like to point out is the anterior margin of this big black hole is fairly indistinct. That could be a hint that this is a AAA, uh, intraluminal clot can cause a blurring of the margin. Whereas if you have something like a renal cyst here, it's a lot more distinct. Mind you, it can be quite hard to tie that renal cyst onto the kidney. So the first thing I want to say about the first case is that it's not as easy as in the workshops. Sometimes you've only got a very brief view. And you have to think to yourself, what else could this be? Look at this picture. Is that a AAA? Ah, actually, that's someone with the probe reversed on a very large IVC. So remember, there are other things that cause black holes in the tummy. You've got to think laterally. Check that you've got your side right. And even consider scanning through the back. Most of all, when you're just starting, you don't want to disadvantage the patient. Don't rely on your scans if you have any doubt at all. The second case is an elderly patient with a known AAA. The patient comes in with mild hypotension and some distress. Now in this one it's pretty definitely a AAA uh, in trans and in long. But the questions we have to ask 
well, is it ruptured? Is that what's causing the pain and hypotension? Do we stop with just these two pictures? In fact, what else should we do? And it really depends on how much help you've got. If it's more important to give this patient a cannula and analgesia, then you should put the probe down. If you've got plenty of other people looking after the patient, then by all means, look further in the abdomen. Put on the color Doppler, see if you can see a leak anywhere, and look for signs of retroperitoneal fluid. Now, our pictures are suggestive perhaps of a ruptured AAA, but they're, unless you can actually show the flow from the lumen to the outside, you can't be sure. It's really a good idea to look at the lower poles, the inferior poles of the kidneys, because this is where retroperitoneal fluid extends. This particular picture I'm showing you here is not retroperitoneal extension. This is the edge artifact. But I have a picture later showing the same thing. Now this particular patient had an advanced health directive and received fluid resuscitation, which then put the patient into pulmonary edema and the patient died a few days later. Ever since, we've got quite a bit of argument as to what should have been the management of this patient. The uh, non-contrast CT was uh, indecisive, to say the least. Well, you can't do too much more, other than to say it is very hard to prove rupture, particularly if you haven't the uh, luxury of a contrasted CT. So if you do have to assume rupture, if you're going to proceed as though the case is ruptured, then you must monitor your resuscitation very carefully. Case 3 is a middle-aged patient with abdominal pain and diarrhea. Now there's a known medium-sized AAA. And when we put the probe on, yeah, it's obvious. You note that if you're in a hurry, using the pictogram option on some of your ultrasound machines can be a really good way of giving a quick idea of probe position. But the question is, is the AAA actually what's causing the pain? Now, certainly in my life I have missed a, a gut obstruction and a hernia simply because I've been distracted by a really nice AAA. In this case, we can see that there's actually good vascular flow in the walls in the right iliac fossa. However, when we look in the left side, left iliac fossa and left loin, the bowel doesn't look quite so healthy. It's not moving, there's no peristalsis that you expect in the small bowel, and the wall does appear thick. Whenever small bowel is still, you have to get concerned about hypoperfusion. And in fact, this patient turned out to have mesenteric ischemia diagnosed by contrast CT. Certainly, whenever you see thickened bowel wall that's not moving, you have to worry about mesenteric ischemia. Don't let the fact that you've found a nice big AAA lead you into the diagnosis of rupture automatically. There are other causes of abdominal pain. Case 4 is a middle-aged patient who's blue and grunting. From the foot of the bed it looks like severe abdominal pain, but our assessment is hindered by intellectual impairment. Frankly, I was sure it was a triple A. The patient was aware, but grunting and rocking. Hypotensive, hypoxic, that sort of mottled blue colour that you associate with severe um, catecholamine surge and holding a large abdomen as if it was painful. So I set out to find the AAA. I was quite sure it would be there. Um, first view through the pancreas showed me, well, I wondered if that was the abdominal aorta, so I turned laterally and discovered, nope, that was the IVC. Better look a bit further. While I was there, I did notice that the gallbladder seemed fairly normal. Uh, there was no fluid behind the bladder on the superpure view. 
When I had a closer look at the right kidney, it seemed all right. In fact, the left kidney seemed okay as well, although fairly sparse on the cortex. And perhaps I wondered, was that the abdominal aorta just to the inferior pole of that uh, left kidney? But by this time I was getting a little bit worried because I hadn't actually seen a definite aorta anywhere. I hunted further around. I looked in the left abdomen and although I found a bit of hypoperfused uh, small bowel, I still couldn't find the abdominal aorta. So I thought I'd go right up to the heart and look at the aortic root and see if there was anything dodgy up there. And uh, while I was there, it suddenly became obvious that this patient's ejection fraction was not very good. See that mitral leaflet not moving far at all. This started to ring warning bells. I had another look on the parasternal short axis view at the left ventricle. The ejection fraction was really quite poor. Notice the beeline's inferior to the left ventricle. Arr. Had a look further around the lungs and found these beelines everywhere. In fact, there were bilateral small pleural effusions. It got through my thick head that this might not actually be an abdominal aneurysm. I went back to look at the chest x-ray and when you look at the chest x-ray looking for pulmonary edema, suddenly it becomes obvious. At this point, we forgot the AAA diagnosis and concentrated on the preload reduction. Still, I went back trying to find that abdominal aorta and it wasn't until I looked at the CT scan. We had to get a CT scan because the patient did seem to have abdominal pain. And it showed that that aorta was so calcified that it was probably uh, sono-opaque. In fact, it was like a rigid tube. When I went back yet again to look at my pictures, I think the aorta was possibly hidden in this shadow down here. So the learning point from this particular case is that acute LVF can look for all the world like a triple A and the aorta can still humble us. Case 5 is an elderly patient with low back pain known to have a triple A but does have an advanced health directive at this point is alert and understressed and talking sensibly. There is definitely a AAA there and it's enlarged since the last presentation. We get a quick view before the patient's called to see CT. So we aren't able to complete the scan. Unfortunately, as the patient's moved in CT, the patient collapses and becomes unresponsive. Very rapid scan is performed and uh, the report is that there are no signs of rupture within the limits of a non-contrast scan. The patient's taken back to resuscitation for comfort measures and a very quick view of the lower pole of the right kidney shows loss of the margin, a very indistinct border suggesting of a retroperitoneal extension of fluid. So what do we learn from this last case? Should we have finished the POCA scan before allowing the patient to CT? When I started this talk, I was telling you that uh, we still make mistakes with our POCA scans. And at the end of the talk, I want to say to you, yeah, but acknowledging and understanding and learning from these mistakes, should we then be able to place more respect on our POCA scanning and not always let the patient go to CT when they call. Should we in fact start to apportion more respect for our skills? 
I hope these cases have been useful for you.